Welcome. My name is Phyllis Ellis, and I have the pleasure of being your MC for today's event. Thank you all for coming. On behalf of the Brockton Branch Area NAACP, we would like to welcome our friends, our families, our members, our sponsors, and our distinguished guests. Our theme today is, what is your dream? Martin Luther King had a dream. He had a dream that one day this nation would rise up and realize the true nation of his creed, that we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. He had a dream that his four children would grow up and live in a nation and be judged not by the color of their skin, but by the character, by the content of their character. We have a great program here for you today. Martin Luther King once said, people fail to get along because they, because they fear each other. They fear each other because they do not know each other. They do not know each other because they have not communicated with each other. Well, today, we want to communicate with you. Father God, Lord of our life, we thank you for the assembling of thy people. Father God, we humble ourselves as we did, amen, for Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, who resides with you in heavenly realms. We thank you for sending your prophet, Dr. King, a voice, a servant, a mentor for the ages, for the ages in terms of social justice and righteousness for all of mankind. When Brockton is home, everything is within reach. And I think that symbolizes a lot about what our city is about going into the 21st century. We're a city of opportunity and uh, a city of opportunities for fair housing, opportunities for a top-notch education for every child that grows up in the city, regardless of their challenges, and we're a city of economic opportunity uh, because we are rebuilding the economy in this city and we are going in the right direction again. And we realize that the future growth of our city's economy is going to be built around minority-owned businesses, women-owned businesses, immigrant-owned businesses. That's the future of our city in the 21st century, and that's what we're building right now, is this vision of a new Brockton. And we're also a, a city of Brockton that I think in the 21st century is a leading-edge city. Uh, we, the city of Brockton looks like, and will look like, what the rest of the country is going to look like as the century progresses. And so we're not just a city, we're not just a multiracial city, we're also becoming a city of multiracial residents. And that shows that we're ahead of the curve because we do have so many communities here living together and we're committed to making sure that as Brockton prospers and grows, that all of the folks of all of the communities in our city are sharing equally in that opportunity to go forward. I'm always amazed at the the breadth of uh, writings by Dr. King and uh, the, the topics that he covered uh, and a recurring theme that appears in his, his writings and, and the narrative of his, his life was his warning about complacency. And I, I pulled up probably a dozen speeches over the last week at where, he, where Dr. King came back to the issue of complacency. And he warns about us being content with things as they are now, the status quo. And I, I think for many Americans, including myself, I will confess to this, that the fact of President Obama's election, the first African-American president elected in our history, uh, was rightfully a, a wonderful reflection of racial progress in this country. But, but I also wonder at the same time whether we gave ourselves too much credit, too much credit for progress because we elected Barack Obama president. It was a wonderful, wonderful moment and a wonderful symbol of, of progress. But I wonder if that symbolism of electing the first African-American president may have caused us some over self-congratulation and, 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 and induced a measure of complacency that we had accomplished more than maybe at a deeper level we actually had. So I, I, think it, it, I think the events of this last year, the situation in Missouri, the situation in New York with Mr. Gardner, I think 
those caused us to refocus on the deeper meaning of social justice in this country. And, and, and if anything, if you can take a, a, a silver lining out of those tragedies, if anything, it, I think it causes us to refocus, reassess, and recommit, which is the, which is the essence of the, the mission of the NAACP, especially here in Brockton. The Office of the National Association for the advancement of colored people. In accordance with its constitution and bylaws. In accordance with its constitution and bylaws. And the decision of its governing body. And the decision of its governing bodies. Now this gets to be personal. I dedicate myself. I dedicate myself. A new. A new. To its principles of equality, to its principles of equality and, justice. and justice, under law, under law, I shall try always, I shall try always to keep the goals of the NAACP, to keep the goals of the NAACP above, above any purely personal, any purely personal, any purely personal, any purely personal individual interests, individual interests that I might hinder. That I might hinder the attainment, the attainment of, those goals. of those goals. I ask, I ask the, continued help the continued help of Almighty God, of Almighty God in, keeping in keeping this pledge. This pledge. God bless you. Give them a hand. <laughs> The poet and playwright Langston Hughes wrote in 1951, what happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun, or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like a rotten meat, or crust and sugar over like a syrup sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load, or does it explode, or does it explode? Use is questioning what becomes of a dream that is delayed, tossed aside, or thwarted by external forces. Though the poem is not explicitly political and deals with desires and aspirations in general, it ties to the broader exploration of African-American dream and the American dream as a whole. Blacks in America had few opportunities to pursue their dream during the era when you wrote that poem. Blacks in America had few opportunities to pursue their dreams without having to pit or put their lives in danger, as that of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., whose life and legacy we celebrate today. But today, we continue to dare you to dream. We encourage you to dream, and we challenge you to dream. Dream of your future and the future of your children. Don't allow your dreams to be delayed, tossed aside or thwarted by external forces. The explosion of your dreams should be a release of positive energy, a release of positive energy. When I am down and hold my soul so weary, when trouble comes and my heart burden be, then I am still and wait there in the silence until you come and sit a while with me. Today we remember Martin Luther King Jr. as an iconic figure. We remember him as he wanted to be remembered as a drum major for justice, for peace, and righteousness. But as we take pause on what would have been his 86th birthday to take measure of the man in the movement, it's worth noting that it was not his design or desire to be so remembered when he started his pastorate at Dexter Avenue Baptist Church in Montgomery. Mm -hmm. I didn't know Dr. King personally, but I did get to know his wife, Coretta Scott King, through having served on the board of the MLK Center in Atlanta. 
And during one of our many conversations, she shared with me what it was like in the early days. She said that when Martin went to Montgomery, Alabama, being a part of a great movement, leading a movement, being America's preeminent moral voice was the furthest thing from his mind. He went to Montgomery to simply pastor Dexter Avenue Baptist Church, to finish writing his dissertation, to begin his family, to hone his oratorical and pastoral skills and prepare himself for another more prestigious appointment at some point in the then not too distant future. But she said, <laughs> you know, something happened. God has a way of changing our plans. You have it within you to dream a dream as big as the times demand. You have it within yourselves to make the difference. I do believe that at the end of the day, we are masters of our fate and captains of our souls. Lenny and I have spent a good part of our earlier years. He was less gray and I had more hair. <laughs> Working in Boston to make it a better place. And let me tell you what I learned about those changes that we've seen in Boston over the last 40 years. And that is that change came because there were conscious decisions to change. There were agents and advocates for change, from downtown to in town, among those who sat in boardrooms to those who pushed brooms. I'm not going to leave you, Mr. Mayor. I think he's more adept at this than me. I'm not going to leave you with a, li a laundry list of strategies to meet these challenges. That really is the easy part. I've come to say first things first. If you're going to be faithful in the moment, it starts with a consensus and a commitment, and then and only then can come the concrete plan. To paraphrase, to paraphrase an old adage, where there's a will, you can find a way. There are a lot of smart people in this community, and I'm convinced that you can figure this out. You can bridge the divides that must be overcome. You can get this done. It is what you must do if you are going to be faithful in the moment. You've done it before. We've done it before. You can do it again. And I promise you that if you do, to paraphrase Pierre Teilhard de Chardin, it will be a day when after having mastered worlds, the waves, the tides, and gravity, we shall have harnessed for God, the energies of love. And then, for the second time in the history of the world, we will have discovered fire. Thank you. Welcome once again to all for our 19th annual luncheon on the life of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I especially want to welcome our keynote speaker, Shana Barnes, and her family and friends. Good afternoon and welcome. Good afternoon. I grew up in Baltimore and we always say good afternoon uh, in response. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome you here and uh, before we have our opening prayer from Reverend Stephen Schaff, who's the um, pastor of South, the South Coast region of the Boston Church of Christ, which uh, our new, uh, we are now sharing space with them and are very glad to welcome me here. I do want to welcome uh, our 
elected officials uh, who are honoring us with their presence today, uh, Mayor Bill Carpenter, who you will hear from a little later, uh, State Representative Claire Cronin, State Representative Mike Brady, City Councilwoman Michelle Dubois, uh, City Councilor Bob Sullivan, and of course, City Councilor Shana Barnes, who will be our keynote speaker. The 50th anniversary of the 1965 March at Selma is being commemorated this year with the release of the film Selma. How many of you have seen it? All right, or are see, planning on seeing it? Oh, yes. Those are my tomorrow plan, my uh, plans tomorrow as well. Regrettably, the film represents the march as many see it today only as an act of political protest. Dr. Susanna Heschel, the daughter of Abraham Joshua Heschel, writes beautifully about how her father, and for many participants, the march was both an act of political protest and a profoundly religious moment, an extraordinary gathering of nuns, priests, rabbis, black and white, a range of political views from all over the United States. Perhaps more an act of celebration of the success of the civil rights movement than of political protest, Selma affirmed that the movement had won the conscience of America. President Lyndon Johnson had just declared, we shall overcome, and congressional passage of the Voting Rights Act would come quickly. And thanks to the religious beliefs and political convictions of the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr., coalitions had been built, religious differences overcome, and visions articulated that meshed political and religious goals. Heschel felt that the prophetic tradition of Judaism had come alive at Selma. He said that King told him it was the greatest day in his life and that he was reminded at Selma of walking with the Hasidic, with the ultra-Orthodox Rebbe's in Europe. Such was the spiritual atmosphere of the day. When he returned, Heschel famously said, for many of us, the march from Selma to Montgomery was about protest and prayer. Legs are not lips and walking is not kneeling, and yet our legs uttered songs. Even without words, our march was worship. I felt my legs were praying. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Steve Santos. I'm the manager of the Stop and Shop on Belmont Street. And I'd first like to say how much of an honor it is to be invited to participate in this celebration of the great Martin Luther King Jr. Dr. King was a leader and one of great principles and values. One of those principles that resonates with me is the importance of maintaining involvement in the communities and the organizations for which an individual serves. As an organization, Stop and Shop also values this principle. I personally would like to thank the community of Brockton for allowing us to be a part of it. In 2014, Stop and Shop celebrated its 100th year anniversary. And I'm also proud that the location on Belmont Street has been serving this community for over 20 years. 600 men and women crossed the Edmund Pettus Bridge only to be beaten back with bull whips, clubs, trampled by horses, dog attacks, and tear gas. This day is remembered, anybody remember what, the, what it was called? Bloody Sunday. This is when the movement began to, to gain nationwide support. Two days after, the movement at this time, in, now including white supporters from all over the nation, followed Dr. King as he led the march again as far to, as to the bridge. However, call it intuition or just being obedient to his purpose at the time, Dr. King saw the troopers lined up, knelt to pray, and turned the march around to avoid the same violence as the Sunday before. To ensure this time they would not be moved, Dr. King petitioned the federal court in Selma to allow the now more than 1,400 people access safely across the bridge. Sunday the 21st of March in 65, Dr. King led a march of now more than 3,000 from Selma to Montgomery. This time the uniformed officers they saw weren't the ones that beat them and spat on them, but were there to protect them, the 58 mile, five day long journey. On the fifth day of their journey, the marchers reached the state capital, Montgomery. It's important to note that 
this seemingly small kind of uh, uh, group that started out uh, initially, 600 people. By the time they got to the Capitol after five days, they were 25,000 people. And they include uh, famous faces like Rosa Parks, Harry Belafonte, Sidney Poitier, Sammy Davis Jr., Peter, Paul, and Mary, <laughs> and Martin Sheen, to just name a few. When the marchers arrived at the Capitol building, they broke out their American flags to show that black people were Americans too and that they had earned their right to vote. Every mile of that 58 miles from Selma to Montgomery was a long walk towards freedom. We are still figuratively and some literally marching today. Yesterday it was mentioned at the NAACP breakfast that we have to be careful to not become satisfied and complacent because we now have a black president. Yes, he, his election, and, and I'd even argue my own, um, are direct reflections of what Dr. King envisioned uh, over 50 years ago. But we are not done yet. And as long as race, class, gender, sexual orientation plays a part in judgments and the prejudging of others, we still have plenty of miles to march. I am hopeful that we'll get there. Maybe not today, maybe not tomorrow, but if we really dedicate ourselves to what could be, it can be. God bless you and God bless these United States of America. Thank you. Everyone should come together on this day and celebrate the victory and the pursuit of victory. Black History Month will include the name of Martin, Dr. Martin Luther King, but let's continue to celebrate it during this weekend. And finally, all the speakers were great, but the day was made by whom? Sharon Wolder. And just as all the other speakers were saying, and the thread was running through the day about lifting each other up, she's saying what? Wind beneath my wings. Hmm? Wind beneath my wings, and that was great. But what was the other song? Oh, I'll sing it for you. You raise me up so I can stand on mountains. You raise me up to sail the stormy sea. I am strong when I am on your shoulders. You raise me up to more than I can be. So have fun with that for the next year. <laughs> and thank you very much. <laughs>
Even the state of Mississippi, a state sweltering with the heat of injustice, sweltering with the heat of oppression, will be transformed into an oasis of freedom and justice. I have a dream that my four little children will one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day down in Alabama with its vicious racist, with its governor, having his lips dripping with the words of interposition and nullification. Yeah. One day right there in Alabama, little black boys and black girls will be able to join hands with little white boys and white girls as sisters and brothers. I have a dream today. I have a dream that one day every valley shall be exalted. Every hill and mountain shall be made low, the rough places will be made plain, and the crooked places will be made straight, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. This is our hope. This is a faith that I go back to the South with. With this faith, we will be able to hew out of the mountain of despair a stone of hope. With this faith, we will be able to transform the jangling discords of our nation into a beautiful symphony of brotherhood. With this faith, we will be able to work together, to pray together, to struggle together, to go to jail together, to stand up for freedom together, knowing that we will be free one day. This will be the day, this will be the day with all of God's children be able to sing with new meaning my country tears of thee sweet land of liberty of thee i sing land where my fathers died land of the pilgrim's pride from every mountainside let freedom ring and if america is to be a great nation this must become true and so let freedom ring from the prodigious hilltops of new hampshire let freedom ring from the mighty mountains of New York. Let freedom ring from the heightening Alleghenies of Pennsylvania. Let freedom ring from the snow-capped Rockies of Colorado. Let freedom ring from the curvaceous slopes of California. But not only that, let freedom ring from Stone Mountain of Georgia. Let freedom ring from Lookout Mountain of Tennessee. Let freedom ring from every hill and mole hill of Mississippi, from every mountainside. Let freedom ring, and when this happens, and when we allow freedom ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city, we will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last, thank God Almighty, we are free at last. Lift every voice and sing to